The Tour de France continues on its record-breaking schedule, more than four kilometres an hour better than the record set by Miguel Indurain a year ago. The first real breakaway came yesterday, and Belgian Johan Museu won the Maillot Jaune. Welcome to the Tour de France. Today the riders are in chalon sur marne and we're facing up to stage eight. That success yesterday by Johan Museu, who finished third on the stage to take the overall lead, means that Belgium is now enjoying its finest tour since 1985. That breakaway did a lot too to alter the overall situation. Museu is now leading Alvaro Mejia from Colombia by 39 seconds. The winner yesterday, Bjorn Ries, is now third. Mario Cipollini, the leader, is down to fourth and a minute and 21 seconds off the lead now. Bruno Kengialta, who fell in the finishing sprint, is fifth. Of the other big names, they're all taking a back seat just now. Alex Zula is 10th, Eric Brooking is 12th, Claudio Chiapucci is 21st, Miguel Indurain is 27th, and the world champion Gianni Bugno even further back in 36th place. Now, you would have thought yesterday, wouldn't you, that with three men in the breakaway, the Motorola boys would at least provided us with the winner. But in fact, they were outmaneuvered by the Ariostia team. Their tactics were better. He's Paul Sherwin to explain. Yesterday, Motorola tried to play the big tactical card. Three men in a breakaway is a luxury on the stage of the Tour de France. It's always an advantage to have strength in numbers. So when Barney Rice punctured, believing he was no danger for the stage win, they waited for him to rejoin the group. With so far to go, they could still use an extra man to work. And if they hadn't waited, then Rice's teammate, Ken Gialta, would no longer have collaborated. When it came to the final kilometers, Motorola's Max Chiandri was favorite to win because of his fast finishing sprint. That, however, did not take into account the superb 1-2 worked on them by the Ariostia team. Barney Rice psychologically prepared for the finish when he emptied his pockets of the remaining contents, thus reducing the weight he had to carry. His teammate, Bruno Kengialta, launched a vicious attack with just over one kilometer to go. This forced Motorola's Alvaro Mejia to chase him down, taking the sting out of their lead-out. Chiandri was thus left alone to sprint against Museo. However, they were both foiled when Rice, not renowned as a fast finisher, surprised them both with his final burst for the line. Just going to prove that even when you're in the majority and sure of a win, you can still be outboxed. Well, another chance today perhaps for Max Chiandri on this route between the towns of chalon sur marne and Verdun. 184.5 kilometers the way the race is going, you could actually drive to the town direct in less than an hour. A nice gentle rollout for the riders today from another beautiful French town. And the rider in the yellow jersey, another Belgian this tour, Johan Museu, who's now got to defend it all of the way to Verdun. The weather is looking quite nice. Well, it should remain that way for the rest of the morning, but there's a possibility of slight rain clouds in the afternoon. The westerly wind that we've had for the last few days will continue. It should be a tailwind to start off with, but it could swing round to become a headwind in the last part of the stage. After only four kilometers, there was a major crash, the biggest of the tour so far, and more than 20 riders came down, and among them was the winner of the stage at Evre, Jesper Skibby of Denmark. Thankfully, there was no injury, and all of the riders rejoined the race. After wearing the yellow jersey, Mario Cipollini of Italy was now in the green jersey as leader of the race on points. He was in the action very, very soon after the start. At the town of Catrachon, the first time bonus sprint, Cipollini was showing a clean pair of wheels to Wilfred Nellison and to Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. Whether you win or lose, a domestique's job is never done. Here, Motorola's Frankie Andreo loads up with drinking bottles to take up to help his leaders. After 115 kilometers, it was the Frenchman Pascal Lance who started to shake off the field. He goes alone. With 25 kilometers to go, his lead was up to 1 minute and 30 seconds. And perhaps not surprisingly, it was the GB team of Johan Museo, the race leader, who was trying to contain him. And Pascal Lance is still hovering in front of the peloton, but the fact that there are a lot of vehicles passing him, but certainly not the rider on horseback here, I think, Paul, that the field is beginning to close in. 
He's been away for quite a while now, and there was no chase earlier on organised behind. But I think now as we get nearer to the climb, the main field will speed up a little bit, and soon they'll see Pascal Lance because they know if he can get to the top of the climb alone, he has a good chance of winning this stage. And there's the main field, the traditional arrowhead now being formed by the riders who were so successful yesterday, the Ariostia team. This is Rolf Yerman setting the pace at the front. The Ariostia boys have had a very good day out on the small hills today. They've consolidated their lead in the King of the Mountains with the Barney Rees. And Rolf Yarman here will be thinking of a good result later on next week in the Alps because he's a very, very good climber. David Cassani is in second place overall in the King of the Mountains. Well, two kilometres to go to the top of the climb here. And the gap is coming down quite rapidly now. So they're on the climb now of the final hill of the day. It's third category, so it's reasonably hard. It's the Côte de Duomont. And Pascal Lance visibly now not climbing as quickly as the chaser behind and he knows it that's always a sure sign the rider is getting tired when he starts to check over his shoulder to see if anybody is coming up on the right hand side there miguel indirain is riding in the second row making sure he has an eye on what's going on he doesn't want to get caught out by a little group going away on the descent there on the left hand side of the picture a young frenchman i think we may see a lot of in this year's tour de france laurent brochard and then just coming outside in the white jersey is gianni bugno the reigning world champion the man most interested on the climb, you can spot him in the centre. He, he always looks as though he's got measles, doesn't he? But that's the polka dot jersey of the leading climber in the Tour de France, Bjorn Ries, the winner yesterday. He'll be looking for a second place on this climb at least, unless they can wipe out this lead on the climb of Lance. But now there's a counter-attack coming, and it's coming here from Claudio Chiapucci, I think. It is indeed, and we were only talking earlier on today amongst ourselves that we hadn't seen too much of Chiapucci annoying the race this year before the time trial, or maybe today he's going to try and see if he can snatch himself a cheeky win. Well, the reaction comes straight away behind. In second place, the Castorama rider is Laurent Brochard, the man I was just talking about. Third is the American champion, Lance Armstrong, and a lotto rider covering the move too, which may well be Jan Navens, and it's all come together. Pascal Lance tried, but it has failed for him today. So Lance caught on the last climb of the day at 172 kilometres, just something like 12 kilometres left to the finish, and he's wiped away. And Claudio Chiapucci, one of the top riders in the last three Tours de France, is the man that has led the field up to him. Brochard now jumping 900 metres to the finish. Pascal, uh, sorry, Lance Armstrong, the wrong Lance, that one. Lance Armstrong now taking his wheel, a champion of the United States. Third place will be the Ariosi rider, David Cassani. Within 500 metres to the King of the Mountains, he's going to try and take the points there because it's a very close battle between he and his teammate, Bjarni Rice. Sani, the policeman, in third place. Armstrong looks over his shoulder, so too does Brochard. Now it looks as though Kasani is going to have to do it because Bjarni Rice has not come up to this little trio yet anyway. We're around about 500 metres to the summit. They're leaving Brochard to roast at the front. And Kasani has got second place. Lance Armstrong not too interested in the King of the Mountains competition. Might be looking for an early move, though, over the top and to put home an attack. Well, the big leaders of the Tour de France have been very careful today. Miguel Indirain just coming up there behind, keeping an eye on this move. Doesn't want anything to go clear. And Kia Pucci recovered very quickly from that attack. Is in fifth or sixth position there. Brochard left to just keep the rhythm. He started the attack, and so they're letting him try on the front. Now Kasani moving off his shoulder, and Kasani has seen the banner, and he's somebody gone on the inside. It's one of the class boys. It looks like Tony Rominger, who's trying to get away here onto the line. And indeed it is, well, Tony Rominger, the rider who's lost so much time because of that team time trial, just reminding everybody he's still in this Tour de France, and he is now going for the prize on the top of the climb. Kasani is going to go for him, though. He's looked over his shoulder. He wants his teammate to come up here, but he's not going to make it. And neither is he going to pass Tony Rominger, who takes the climb of the day at Duomont. And behind him was Cassani, and Indurain was just off the back of that pair as well. And there is the memorial to the dead of the First World War on the right of the picture. And in fact, the entourage of the Tour de France has officially requested a minute's silence by everybody as they go past this tribute to the First World War. So with that, we'll take a break.
Today's tour destination is, to say the least, an unusual one. It's the town of Verdun, a name as emotive in France as Stalingrad in Russia or Dresden in Germany. In 1916, its green hills were the site for one of the bitterest battles of World War I, a million French and German troops dying in a ten-month siege of the town. Verdun has been a barracks town since Roman days, and it was almost entirely destroyed during the fighting in the First World War. Today, though, it has been lovingly restored, with relaxed streets, elegant houses, and a young population that's been eagerly awaiting the tour's first ever visit here. Special bicycle races and daily parades are much in evidence. Over this tranquil present, though, looms the past. The proud knight of the Monument to Victory, a tribute to the courage of a town, awarded the Legion of Honor after the events of 1916. A starker view of the conflict is afforded by Rodin's commemorative statue near today's finishing line, winged victory here, entangled in the arms of the dead. Verdun was the linchpin of the French defences, and when the Germans attacked it on the 21st of February in 1916, it was to be defended at all costs. It held, but the price was enormous. Eight villages were wiped off the map, and a 25 kilometer radius around the town was left barren. The greenery has now returned, but much remains of the battlefield. Trenches around the Fort Douaumont and the fort itself, scene of some of the worst fighting. Nearby is the immense National Cemetery, with the graves of 15,000 dead from both sides. The bones of a further 100,000 unidentified French and German troops are buried in the vaults of the adjacent Ossuaire. At the memorial erected by the survivors, French and German flags fly side by side. Inside the building, there's a tribute to cyclists who died in the fighting. Three of the last five to win the Tour de France before the war were killed during it. Octave Lapise, Francois Favre and Lucien Petit-Burton. Three quarters of a century on, the battlefields are popular with visitors of all nationalities. As the guidebooks say, it's a strange sight to pass into tourism, but an instructive one. So, 77 years after the battle which raged around this town, the Tour de France will finally roll into Verdun. They'll come in on a route which will take them over the battlefield and pass the most important monuments to the conflict here. The Verdun of today will undoubtedly welcome the race with open arms, and the Verdun of the past will be remembered. And indeed it will, James, and those former winners of the Tour de France are still talked about on this race with great affection. Now, you rejoin us, and as you do, we're just receiving news that Alex Zula, one of the pre-race favourites, apparently has crashed just after the sprint there on the last climb, and there are rumours, Paul, that he may have broken bones. Well, they're saying over the race radio he's holding his right shoulder as if maybe he's got a problem with his collarbone, but Dr Port, the race doctor of the Tour de France, is alongside him, helping him up at the moment. What's happening at the moment at the race is the big leaders of the Tour de France are actually fighting it out, and Stephen Roach is one of them trying to move away at the moment. So as we watch the field speed on here, we could be receiving news of the first uh, big casualty of this year's Tour de France, Alex Zula, the rider who finished second in the prologue time trial to Miguel Indurain, and was certainly looking forward to the big time trial coming up tomorrow. More news of that as it unfolds to us here. And this is Stephen Roach, and I think that's Perini who's come up behind in third place with the balding head, but that shouldn't, uh, shouldn't hamper him at all. Well, Roach is moving clear there with Perini, and that looks like uh, Tibaldi is going clear with him as well, one of the Castorama riders. Miguel Indurain is in this group behind, and in fact it is Indurain who's setting the tempo at the front along with the yellow jersey, so there shouldn't be any change in the overall classification tonight, but what is important is actually what is happening behind, because this is about 35 riders moving clear, and it would be nice to be able to get down there and see exactly who has missed this split. Well, as Roach turns the screw a little tighter and tries to get this group away, we'll have a look at some of our statistics for the day. There were 172 starters today, and nine riders have now given up the Tour de France. This morning, in fact, Stefano Cortinovis it didn't start for the Lamprey team, and since then, Eric van der Laarde for the word perfect team, and the previous Belgian to, alert to lead the Tour de France in 1985 before this year has abandoned the race sick. The average speed a little bit slower today, 40.25 kilometres an hour, but we're still on that record Tour de France at 43.627 kilometres an hour. Johan Museo is in the lead of the race. Jan Rees has consolidated his lead today in the King of the Mountains and Mario Cipollini has done the same in that green jersey. And here is Alex Zula. Well, he's riding the race, even if he, he may well have a suspected broken bone in either his collarbone 
or somewhere in that region because it's still very unclear all of the radios were cut off as we passed the memorial there at the top of the climb of the Duamont but at least he's trying to get through to the finish and then he will probably go off for x-rays well he looks as if he's up and going there he's got two or three teammates to try and help him but what is important whether or not is the fact that he's going to lose an awful lot of time because at the front of the race it's going very quickly at the moment this is Perini the ZG rider at the front there Stephen Roach doing an incredible ride closing up the back of the group here in third place a Roach who never looks to be trying he sits there and the old legs keep whirling round he's riding his last Tour de France and he wants to ride it well with Perini who's up there with him too and another one of the team leaders Dominique Arnoux the world cyclo cross champion winner of the first stage of the Tour de France a year ago at San Sebastian and as you can see behind the chase is taking this move very seriously indeed one of the word perfect riders coming up there it may well be Raul Alcala who I saw to the front of the group as we went over the top of the climb and they really have made a mess of this peloton today a small climb like that a third category climb at the end and everybody was coming up to the front in fact it is Alcala followed by Ronan Pensek the rider from Novimai and just tagged on the back is Lance Armstrong the American champion this is a good group they have about 200 meters lead at the moment over the rest of the field this is a serious breakaway here and at the moment the race radio seems to have gone down and they're not being able to identify exactly who is in that group behind we have a good working group of six riders in the front here and it's about uh, 200 meters to the chasing group behind there which for the moment the majority of the leaders are in there five kilometers to go I know Miguel Indurain is in the back group Claudio Chiapucci and the yellow jersey of Johan Museo but what has happened to the other riders like Alex Zula is not coming through on the radio at the moment and look at the man who won the Tour de France in 1983 and 1984 once the king of time trialing but no longer is Laurent Fignon in that magnificent time trial a year ago by Miguel Indurain in Luxembourg he was actually caught for six minutes which was almost unbelievable now he's trying to drag this race they've split the field in the pursuit this is a small advanced chase group Massimo Girotto looking over his shoulder looked almost surprised that the field was split and a counter move has gone again from the Gator 18 they're trying desperately to drag Bunyo back into this race Claudio Chiapucci is here Johan Brunel is here the rider who won the fastest ever stage of the Tour de France a couple of days ago and there's the race leader Johan Museo he's here as well a quick check there on the time of Alex Zula he is in fact one minute and 40 seconds behind at the moment and you can see the way he's holding his hand and his arm there he really is in agony he wants to try and get to the finish but at the moment the Tour de France is running away from Alex Zula this is the breakaway which took advantage of the confusion it was led by Stephen Roach number 15 former winner of the Tour de France in 1987 Armstrong the champion of the United States is going up to the head of the race now he's in this group Raul Alcala knows all about Lance Armstrong because he beat him in the Tour DuPont in the United States in May but never underestimate this man either Perini he's a superb cyclist and he was in on a wild card with his team this year and I think it was the fact that Perini was on the team that they let that team in the Tour de France and now one kilometre to go for the leaders and they're starting to open up straight away and it looks like Stephen Rhodes well he did this in Valkenberg and it cost him the stage he went too soon now he's going again Pensek has got his back wheel the sprinter Armstrong is fifth down the line watch out for Perini on the back here off goes the bottles that's Alcala thinking of having a go he's in third place but Armstrong and Perini's gone, he was waiting for it and they've looked over, Roach has seen him coming and I think that might spoil the rhythm of Perini, he realised the line and spotted him so he's shut down again and he's waiting for another chance Armstrong has the advantage here, he's on the right side of these riders because he hasn't got to worry about the proximity of those barriers on the left and Armstrong now waits on the wheel of Perini, they've let Stephen Roach fly at the front now as Armstrong starts to go, boxed in a little bit Armstrong boxed in by Dominique Arnoux who won the first stage of the Tour a year ago they pushed Armstrong very very wide indeed as Pensek goes and Pensek really isn't a sprinter this would be a surprise Ronan Pensek leading out now Armstrong goes on the left of the picture Lance Armstrong in his first Tour de France they all said he was too young but he gets it on the line Lance Armstrong the champion of the United States takes it on the line that's a brilliant result for him as the field come home with Phil Anderson trying to show a clean pair of wheels to the bunch for the same team, but he won't do it, as Cipollini also is beaten right on the line. 
and the rider who beat him on the line was Wilfred Nelson who will have pipped Cipollini on the line well a marvelous result for the young American they said at 21 years of age he was too young to come and take part in the Tour de France well he's won a stage now and that for him is going to be the best moment of his career and this is the sprint which gave Lance Armstrong his first victory in his first Tour de France he's the rider third in line of the four so follow him now as you see him start to wind up to top gear and close in rapidly on the man leading it out which was Ronan Pensek Armstrong ripped out of his position and came smoothly through on the rails a very difficult place to sprint uh, through on but he did it and he did it so well and as he comes up to the line he takes it quite easily from Raul Alcala in second place and that's sweet revenge for Alcala beating of him in the Tour Dupont last May and so the arrival now and look at the clock on the left of the screen over two minutes now as Alex Zula is brought home by his teammates and that's Neil Stevens, the, the second rider in line Zula though clearly has injured his right arm or collarbone and may not be starting the Tour de France tomorrow and the young Texas Ranger Lance Armstrong gets the first place today in the Tour de France he beats his old rival Raul Alcala from Mexico into second place Third is Ronan Pensek, and fourth, the champion of the cyclocross, Dominique Arnoux. And straight after the finish, Paul Schoen was alongside the manager of the Motorola team, Jim Okovitz, and the day's winner, Lance Armstrong. It feels good today, especially after yesterday. I think that uh, we, we placed ourselves well yesterday with three out of the seven, and, and I would have bet a lot of money that we weren't going to lose that race yesterday, and we did. So uh, it was definitely on my mind today. I was looking at the, the profile the last couple of days, and I said this could be my day. Everybody thought this stage would be Chiandri's, but after yesterday, was the team a little bit down? Uh, I don't, I mean, I think not all was lost yesterday. I mean, we, we lost the stage, but we, we moved ourselves well up on Team GC, and uh, now we still got second, but that doesn't mean much. Well, that late breakaway did not do anything to alter the overall situation on the eve of the time trial. Johan Museo keeps his leader's yellow jersey, and now you can see the time gaps here that the rest have to consider making up in that time trial tomorrow. And this is the yellow jersey tonight, signed by the race leader of the Tour de France, Johan Museo, and the other signature on it is that of Lance Armstrong. Well, for our competition, there weren't many of you thought of Lance Armstrong, but those of you who did, well, I have to say, you were really inspired today. The name of the winner is Stuart Kinnan from Glasgow. Well done, Stuart, and this yellow jersey will be on its way to you as soon as this Tour de France is over. This is the sad side today, though, that of Alex Zula of the Onsay team, a pre-race favourite who crashes just before the end. He's now off to hospital, and let's hope when he gets there the news isn't bad. We'll update you on this story, of course, in our programme tomorrow. On happier themes, though, the winner today, Lance Armstrong, he got into that leading group of six riders, and then he showed them a clean pair of wheels in the sprint. Until you join us again tomorrow, when it will be the time trial stage of the Tour de France, from James, Paul, and Mithil Liggett, goodbye.